Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you out tonight. My name is Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, George Washington's own presidential library here at Mount Vernon. Uh, for those of you who hadn't had a chance to be there, it's right across the road from here. Uh, we're doing a lot of fantastic things to uh, teach people about the life, leadership, and legacy of George Washington. Uh, it is, unlike many presidential libraries, it is not managed by the National Archives system, but run by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, who, of course, showed their great leadership by saving George Washington's home in the 1850s. It's a private-run organization uh, of importance in the country. Now, tonight, we have a fantastic program for you. Uh, this is a public event as part of our academic conference that we're holding right now, a conference entitled The Pursuit of Leadership, Remembering James McGregor Burns. Uh, and tonight we're going to have an esteemed panel talking about James McGregor Burns, their relationship with his work, as well as George Washington's leadership and presidential leadership more generally. Uh, Burns was a giant uh, as an intellectual, as an activist, as a leader himself. Uh, and I'll allow uh, the following speakers to talk more about his legacy and his significance in some of his work. But for those of you who haven't heard of Burns, he's often called the father of leadership studies and has written some seminal works, including a book called Leadership, uh, which just this afternoon uh, was, was said to have transformed the way people talked about leadership in America. Uh, no small task that. Immediately after the event, uh, I welcome you all to share us for cocktails. I'd like to say a particular thank you to the Distilled Industry Spirits Council of the United States of America, uh, which has uh, generously donated uh, the booze for this evening. But, but before we get to that, the spirits of various kinds, uh, and, and they, if you don't know, I mean, they've been great uh, aides to Mount Vernon and helped fund the restoration of the distillery, uh, which is, of course, help us tell a, a wonderful story of George Washington's entrepreneurship as the largest whiskey distiller in America at the time of his passing. Uh, still much lamented passing of George Washington. All right. Uh, so let's uh, kick off this evening's events. I'm going to do that by introducing one person who's going to come up and introduce uh, the panel uh, itself. Uh, his name is George Gothels, Ph.D., uh, George goes by Al, so if they call him Al uh, during the conversation, that's who they're talking about. Uh, he joined the Jepson School faculty, which is in Richmond, in 2006, before joining Jepson faculty as a holder of the E. Claiborne Robbins Distinguished Professorship in Leadership Studies. He held academic and administrative appointments at Williams College, visiting appointments at UVA, Princeton University, and Amherst, among others. Gothels explores leadership from psychological and historical perspectives. His most recent books have focused on heroes and heroic leadership through an examination of leaders throughout history. With Georgia Sorensen, who is in the room somewhere, I believe, there she is, uh, and James McGregor Burns, he edited the Encyclopedia of Leadership. So that means he knows everything there is to know about leadership. That's with the concept of the encyclopedia that the great French philosophs gave us. And, and, uh, and he's a living example of that mission. Now, with Sorison also, the quest for a general theory of leadership. Uh, and I would say, and on a personal note, he's been working with us in the library as we've been developing our own leadership curriculum. He's helping us think through ways that we can help teach people about leadership and the challenges uh, that people face today. And, and he's a wonderful guy. So please, everybody, please welcome Al Gothels up uh, to kick off the program. Good evening. Let me just say it's, it, it's, a, it's a real treat to be here uh, at Mount Vernon and having an opportunity to discuss James McGregor Burns, presidential leadership, and George Washington in various combinations. Uh, it, it, it is very special for me because I've been aware of Jim Burns' work since I was in high school and in South Station in Boston I picked up his 
uh, volume, John Kennedy, a political profile. And then 10 years later, I was lucky enough to be on the faculty at Williams College, and uh, Jim and I have been, uh, we're, we're, we're close friends and colleagues for, for, for many, many years. Um, uh, he has been a giant um, intellectually in uh, founding leadership studies, really, uh, and, as a, and as a political scientist and, and, and student of government. Um, and in addition to his uh, intellectual prominence and significance, uh, I, I think all of us uh, who worked with Jim uh, would, would speak to his, his generosity, his integrity, uh, his, his, his warmth, and uh, just uh, what a wonderfully inspiring, transforming person he was, uh, both as a, as a scholar and a, and a person. So it's, so it's really very special for me to be here. And, and thank you very much, Doug, for, 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 for this opportunity. Uh, in, in alphabetical order, let me uh, introduce our, our three panelists. Um, first, Michael Beschloss, uh, award-winning and best-selling author of many books uh, related to presidential leadership. Uh, he's a frequent commentator on PBS and, and on NBC. Um, he, he's written so many books. My personal favorite happens to be Presidential Courage, uh, looking at uh, brave things that presidents have done from 1789 to 1989, starting with George Washington and, and up, up through so not, not a long book, you should Ro know. Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, he was a student of James McGregor Burns at Williams College, and that's important. Um, Susan Dunn is professor of humanities at Williams College. She is also a prolific author, although trained as a uh, uh, French uh, literature historian. Uh, she has transformed herself uh, as, as a result of the uh, intellectual, and I, and I would say personal influence of James McGregor Burns. Uh, her book, Sister Revolutions, comparing the French Revolution and the American Revolution is, is wonderful. And then a recent book, uh, called 1940, FDR, Wendell Wilkie, Lindbergh, and Hitler. The election amid the storm is a, is, is a wonderful, wonderful study of a, of a crucial election in American history. Um, she uh, holds down the fort in leadership studies at Williams, a, a, uh, um, a, a program very much initiated by James McGregor Burns. And, and, and third, um, at Larson, um, who is a professor at the um, School of Law at, at, at Pepperdine University. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, again, an author of some very influential and marvelous books. My, my favorite one is Magnificent Catastrophe on the Election of, of, of 1800, and a, a, a wonderful study of Aaron Burr, a, among other people. And then a more recent book, uh, The Return of George Washington, uh, I believe 1783 to 1984. <laughs> That's a, a very provocative title. Uh, Ed is also a graduate of Williams College and was a student of James McGregor Burns. So all three of these people uh, have a lot to say about James McGregor Burns, about the presidency and presidential leadership, and about George Washington. And I think the most um, appropriate way to start is to, is to ask each of them to say a little bit about um, their relationship with Burns and how that inspired the work they have done, and then we're, we'll just open it up. I, I, I will ask some questions, and they might comment on each other's comments, and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll just go from there. So please join me in welcoming these three distinguished scholars. <laughs> And Michael Beschloss will begin. Uh, the problem with doing this, can everyone hear okay? Yeah. I guess if you can't hear, you can't answer. I apologize. Uh, the problem with doing this, I think everyone will agree, we all knew Jim so well that, at least for me, and I'll bet you this is true of Ed and Susan as well, anything I say about him, I'm going to hear his voice in my brain saying, you know, you're completely wrong, or you're laying it on a little bit thick here, or something yeah. like that. So. I think we just have to sort of ignore the, those inner voices. And I guess the other thing is that this whole panel is so Williams heavy that yeah. if there's any Amherst person in the it's room, true. this is your moment to leave so that you're <laughs> not asphyxiated by so That's many good. references to Williams College. Yeah. Uh, one moment in my relationship with Jim, I was his student in the mid-1970s. 
I remained that way for the next 40 years, but when I was an undergraduate. And he was, I see Tom Cronin here, he was the president of the American Political Science Association, 1976, right? Does that sound right to you, Tom? Yeah, I think, because it was the first time I met. No, I think 76, because I'll tell the story, uh, and maybe the story is, is wrong, but what I'm thinking of is annual meeting was at the Palmer House in Chicago, and I was with him, I think I was, it was after my uh, sophomore or junior year. And to show you how long ago that was, nearly 40 years ago, the burning issue at that meeting, among others, was the Equal Rights Amendment, and there was a big cleavage, I think Tom will confirm this, a uh, large number of people who were members of APSA, including Jim, thought that APSA should not meet in the future in any state that had not ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. And there was a minority schism, I think led by Jean Kirkpatrick, if I remember correctly, that thought, thought this was not a great idea, and I'm putting that extremely mildly. And there was about to be a walkout quite dramatic of a lot of people out of this large ballroom, at which point Jim called over to me. I was standing in the back. He said, I appoint you sergeant at arms to lock the doors so that no one can get out and so we, we can fight this out among ourselves. And that's what happened. And they reached some kind of a conclusion. I forget what it was. But to begin with, I mean, people think of Jim to some extent as this Olympian scholar, but part of his leadership was he was also an activist not only in academic organizations, but ran for Congress in 1958, won 45%, largest vote for a Democratic candidate in the first district of Massachusetts since the Civil War against Silvio Conti, and was interested in politics, whether it was at the local level or the national level or international level from that moment on. I first got to know him because I went to a school, I wanted to write history books since I was about 10, and the head of my school said, this is the way things were oftentimes done in those days, this was Phillips Academy Andover, he said, we are sending you to Williams. That's not what they would do these days. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have the power to do so, and Williams did not listen to what, uh, does not these days listen to what heads of school, high schools say anymore. But he said, we're sending you to Williams because you want to write history, and you can go there, and there are real teachers there whom you'll actually get to meet, which might not happen in a big university. And if you're so lucky, he said this very specifically, you might get to work with someone like James McGregor Burns, whose books I had already read, and you know, if he likes you, maybe he'll take you on as a research assistant, and you'll actually learn a lot of things much earlier than you might if you just went through the normal process at a university and on to graduate school. And so it turned out to be. You know, one advantage of being at a place like I'm trying to limit my mentions of Williams College, but <laughs> this college in the northern Berkshires is that there are people who really do want to teach undergraduates and they return your, your calls, uh, and you can have a relationship like that. So that was mine. But to step back from my own experience, you know, just to extremely briefly describe Jim to people who did not know him, or maybe only know him by reputation. In a way, I think, there was an early idea, the language of it was, there was something that was called the physician to the state. It was a term that was used oftentimes in early America. And Jim never would have used that language about him himself. He was too modest. But a lot of what he did in life was show us as citizens and our leaders where we are falling short, how our system can be better. And particularly, and this is true of all of humankind, how each of us can be our best selves. And he had, forgive the term used by someone who does not have the training that Al does, but he had the most momentous super ego of almost anyone I've ever met. And by that I mean he was always criticizing himself, where can I do better as an activist and a thinker, and also as a teacher. So I guess, you know, I, I want to make this extremely brief, so I'll stop here because we'll have more chance to talk about him. But I think that the thing to convey about him that's a little bit hard if you didn't really know him is that this was someone who was serious about all this, but was also just immensely good-hearted and kind and a decent, you know, lived his principles. But most of all, was someone who expanded the idea of leadership, and I'll close with this. When he wrote his now famous seminal book, now called Leadership, uh, 
his idea was that you know, he would try to make the study of leadership something that crossed disciplines, which didn't happen too often before the mid-1970s, I think Al would confirm. And also something that would show people how to practice leadership, not in the ways that we had mostly thought of it, which was like as a CEO of a company or as a governor of a state, but in all of our lives. And the idea was to lift a society morally by practicing leadership in all sorts of ways. And he did that in a scholarly way, but I think he also tried to do that in his personal relationships. Okay. Um, let me, thank you, Michael. Uh, let, let me turn it uh, over to Susan, but just before I do, uh, uh, I, I don't know if, 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 if all of you have this uh, uh, program for the event tonight. I just would like to point out that there's six books here by James McGregor Burns. Two of them on George Washington and on the three Roosevelts uh, were co-authored by Susan Dunn. Susan, please. And, and by the way, the reason I did not mention George Washington is that for a finger painter on Washington to be sitting next to two Picassos, I just <laughs> shut up. So. Wouldn't you say a word about the student thesis this term? Uh, I'd like to hear from Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will later if you want. Michael and I were freshmen together at uh, Williams College. Is this echoing? I think it sounds good. Uh, we were freshmen together in the fall of 1973, but Michael was a freshman student. I was a freshman faculty member. I'm a little bit older. And I she, remember. She started teaching at a very early age. I was only 17. Right. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first faculty meeting I attended. And um, the college owned an, a beautiful estate a few miles out of town. It was an old Rockefeller estate on a beautiful hill. It's called the Mount Hope Estate. And it had been donated by the family to Williams. And Williams was thinking of selling it. It was expensive to maintain. They were, and they, at a faculty meeting, they were discussing whether or not to sell this beautiful estate. And a uh, professor stood up, very tall, very good looking, and said that he did not think the college should sell the Mount Hope estate, and that in fact he had just escorted Lady Bird Johnson up there, and she loved it. And uh, he spoke about the, um, the beauty of the land and the historic significance of the place. And I turned to my friend, uh, an astronomer, Jay Kafikoff, and I said, who is that? And Jay said, that's James McGregor Burns. And I had heard about him when I was at Smith College, and my reaction was, ooh. <laughs> 20 years later, we became a couple. I invited Jim to dinner in the fall of 1992 and we listened to a Clinton-Bush debate. And, uh, Jim's idea of a romantic evening. <laughs> political romantic. Jim. Um, he didn't look at his watch, though. <laughs> right, Not right, the way right. Bush, Bush did. Bush, right, yeah. my, my pretext for inviting him is that uh, Julian Bond was a guest, and I was his host. At Williams, he was a guest for the whole semester at Williams College, and I was his host. So that was my excuse for inviting Jim to dinner, because I had Julian Bond as my guest. Jim spent almost his whole life at, in Williamstown, in this little place in the Berkshires that only the squirrels know how to find. He arrived there as a freshman in 1935, graduated in 1939. And then he uh, spent a year in Washington as an intern, and uh, then a year at Harvard beginning his graduate studies, and then he went into the war. And he was a combat historian. Uh, in fact, his ship was supposed, before he was appointed combat historian, he was with his division, and the division was supposed to go to Europe on a, um, sh a big ship. And um, just before he and his unit were to leave on the ship to Europe, uh, the former president of Williams stopped Jim from going. He, his name was Finney Baxter, James Finney Baxter III. And Finney Baxter had been asked to start a new division in the Army, a new project of combat historians 
who would be on the front lines um, at battles and uh, create maps of the battles and interview soldiers before and after the battle and actually write the, the first living histories uh, of, of actual war. Um, and so Finney Baxter knew Jim because Jim had been his student at, at Williams and he uh, asked the commander of the division to let Jim uh, leave the ship that was just about to leave Europe for Europe and uh, become a combat historian in the Pacific, which Jim did, and he participated in all the major battles, Okinawa, Saipan, and Guam. And so it's interesting that Jim left the uh, division he was supposed to be with, and that ship was bombed as it crossed the Atlantic, and the boys were all lost. So I always say that Finney Baxter saved Jim's life which actually is true. Um, as Michael said, Jim was an activist as well as a scholar. He ran for Congress in 1958. And JFK was also running for his second term in the Senate in 1958. And Jim was campaigning in Western Massachusetts, and so was JFK. And they hit it off, and they became friends. And uh, Jim wrote a biography of uh, JFK, um, and interviewed the family. The family wasn't crazy about the biography because of the last sentence, which Jim declined to change. The last sentence was something about um, he has great intelligence, etc., but whether he has the commitment of mind and heart to... Commitment to any great purpose, I think, something like that. Yes, and um, that was still an open question, so the family was not pleased with that, but Jim wouldn't change it. Nevertheless, they had become friends. And in 1960, JFK is elected president, and um, Jim felt that they were friends, and that Jim had fought the good fight for the Democrats in 1958, and a Senate seat was now open in Massachusetts, and Jim wanted the seat. And so Jim's story was that he went down to Washington, made an appointment with JFK, knocked on the door at the house in Georgetown. No Secret Service was in sight. JFK came to the door, and they went upstairs to a little room, and they chatted, and then Jim came to the point that he was interested in the Senate seat. And um, he knew that the governor, uh, Furcolo, was going to appoint a, a, the new senator, but it would be whomever JFK wanted. And Jim said to JFK, um, I just want you to know I'm interested because otherwise I don't want you to say "Oh, la later, oh, Jim, I didn't know that you were interested in the seat. So Jim said yes, that he was interested in the seat, but he realized he was probably 93 or 94 on the list. And JFK said, oh, no, Jim, you're not 94 or 95 on the list. I'd say you're number two or three on the list. Well, Jim was very elated at this promotion <laughs> from 93 to 2 or 3. And he left. They shook hands. And he said, as they were walking down the stairs, Jim said, I hope you'll be the new Jefferson, the next Jefferson. Then Jim got out on the sidewalk and was still pretty excited about the promotion. But then he realized, hmm, 2 or 3 is really not good enough. You have to be number 1. <laughs> And the, if you're curious, the person whom uh, Foster Furcolo picked was um, JFK's roommate at Harvard, who was the mayor of Gloucester, Massachusetts. And he knew him well enough to know that the mayor of Gloucester would leave the seat in less than two years to make room for Teddy Kennedy, who did run in a special election in November. Uh, 1962, and he couldn't be 100% sure about Jim. He was right. He was right. <laughs> and uh, Life with Jim was a seminar. It was a seminar about politics. My PhD was in French literature, as Al said. And, um, and Jim transformed my life. Now I've written about Roosevelt's The Founding Fathers, uh, Another book, if you're, any of you are Virginians, I have a book called Dominion of Memories, um, Jefferson, Madison, and the Decline of Virginia. And I became a historian because 
Life with Jim was a, a, a seminar, my own private seminar in political science, but it was also a seminar on human kindness and the golden rule and generosity and inclusivity. And um, I must say that my 22 years with Jim were the happiest years of my life because of his intellect and because of, of his heart, of, of who he was as a person. And really, as Michael knows, as Al knows, as Ed knows, as Georgia knows, um, a person who changed our lives. Transformational, he studied transformational presidents, but he himself was transformational. Thank you, Susan. Um, Since you put the topic into play, I, I, I do want to uh, report a conversation that you and I had uh, about Jim, uh, tied to your first seeing him, then becoming a couple 20 years later. You said something like, uh, as, as soon as you found out that, that Jim was divorced, I pounced. Was the, <laughs> you know, was, was, was the, I said that on C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I thought it was just to me. <laughs> We wrote this book, The Three Roosevelts, together, and Brian Lamb, if you recall, uh, interviewed me about The Three Roosevelts. And <laughs> Jim said it was the worst morning of his life because he came down to Washington with me. And at breakfast, I was so nervous that I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> really, I was so nervous. And then um, we go to the uh, C-SPAN studio, and the interview starts going well, but it's long. It's a whole hour, and I was getting tired. And then toward about Three quarters of the way through the interview, uh, Brian Lamb started asking me more personal questions about my family and um, about Jim and how I met Jim. So I went, I'm a little tired and kind of uh, blabbing. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, when I found out he was divorced, I pounced. You, 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 and, she, and, and she did. <laughs> um, and I could imagine my mother saying, <laughs> Uh, you didn't that need to say that woman. on national <laughs> television. Ed Larson is a Pulitzer Prize winning author on um, many uh, uh, aspects of, of, of the founding era. And um, I believe his personal and professional life was also turned around at a, at, a, at a crucial point at Williams College by James and Gregor Burns. Ed, if you could tell us something about your relationship with Ed. Uh, with, with, with Jim, I'm sorry. Surely. Uh, I actually encountered Jim a little before the two of you. I think I was a class ahead of you, and a class before you, um, uh, Susan, arrived um, at Williams. And Jim, at this time, was just working on his book on leadership. It hadn't come out yet. He was still best, best known as the biographer, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, and National Book Award, I think, on the other one, of a two-volume set, which was then considered the best two-volume set on um, Roosevelt, Lion and the Fox, and I'm trying Soldier, to think, of freedom. Soldier of Freedom. And I actually hadn't read them, but my father had. My father was a reader, and he was very pleased that I'd be going to the school where Jim, uh, James McGregor Burns was teaching. And so um, I knew I would, was destined to take a class from James McGregor Burns because my father was paying my tuition bill. <laughs> and so I would have to, um, I, would, I would take this course. Now, when I went to Williams, I was thinking about probably being a political science major. Now, by the time I had Jim in my sophomore year, it's fall semester of my sophomore year, and that would have been 72 because it was when McGovern and Nixon were running against each other for president. And you're right, Jim was an activist, and he was a strong supporter of, of McGovern, at least in that election. And... Um, uh, I was taking his class, and by this time, he was, and that's why I thought that year, at least, he was president of the, of the Political Science Association. He may have become president again in a later year, but uh, I the, had taken political science in the first year, and it wasn't, I expected I'd learn about presidential leadership, or I'd learn about the stories of politics, uh, because I think in stories. I mean, just as I write in stories. And it was all model building. And uh, we just 
whatever political science is, it was just com you use computers and you build these models and I could never quite figure out what they were doing. Um, and so I took Burns's class, because you couldn't take it as a freshman, at least back then. You had to be at least a <coughs> sophomore, sophomore. Most of the people in the class were juniors or seniors, actually. Uh, and so I took the class, and I believe it was actually on, it might have been political leadership. It was focused on congressional leadership, actually, not presidential leadership. And uh, suddenly, here was a political science course of the type that I wanted to take. It was one that, as he said, yes, they call it anecdotal, and he roll his eyes, anecdotal political science. That is telling stories and building the account of political leadership through individual accounts rather than through these sort of computer models, which most of the department had been taken over. And I thrived in the class. I love it. He was, he was in, well, I'll get to that later. He was an incredibly generous man. But the first thing I wanted to say is toward the end of the class, I told him, I said, this is just what I wanted to get in political science. But I don't know anyone else in the department teaching political science like this. I took these first classes, and I was just running computer models, and we were working over numbers. Um, I, and remember, he is at this time president of the Political Science Association. And I said, I really found my history class was more interesting. And I'd never thought about doing history. And so he, he looked at me. And, he, and by this time, I'd been over his house a few times. He said, you know, if I, was, if, if I was at Williams today, I'd be a history major, not a political science mm. major. And I think you should go that way. Uh, he'd already seen my writing. He'd seen the paper I'd written. He said, you should drop political science and go into history uh, and study. If you're interested in presidential leadership or leadership or how politics operates, do it as a historian, not as a political scientist. So talk about influence. That's when I shifted and never took another political science course and moved over to history. Now, by that time, I'd already had a relationship. Because you point out he was a very kind man. Now, he was, he was an activist. He was a type of person who could be a very strong advocate of McGovern and be a very partisan Democrat and yet be totally open with his students to them being uh, conservative Republicans or moderates or having another viewpoint and be entirely supportive and um, work with them in the same way. He never carried, he carried his politics to a class in one way but not in a way that was empowering of the Democrats in his class or the liberals in his class. But he was equally empowering of everyone in his class. And that, that's really remarkable that's because um, that's not normal. And I think by being so open about his own views, it helped him in that respect. Now, we all had to write papers on who our Congress, on our congressmen, on our own congressmen. We were supposed to go back during fall break and re-interview our congressmen or go down to Washington and do truly original work because he wanted to build a volume. He said he wanted to, he was hoping eventually that all of his students would have come from a different congressional district and he would have sort of like the Albanac of American politics, <laughs> but created by the own students and study both the, con the your con member of Congress and, and also the election that was happening in that year. Well, my congressman was the, probably, at that time, the most notorious conservative congressman in the country, John Ashbrook, mm -hmm. who ran against Nixon in the primaries to try to have no left turn. Uh, but a very powerful congressman. He was ranking Republican on, on, uh, on his congressional committee. He was a very powerful congressman. So I went back and gathered all this research um, and put together the story. And, um, and, uh, and Jim Burns was just as interested in of that, in fact, probably more interested in that than he would have been in a, um, in a um, Democratic congressman. But during the course of the semester, that's how generous he is. Um, I was from, obviously, since I was, since I, Ashbrook was my representative, I was from rural Ohio, which is where Ashbrook was from. And um, Jim Burns had invited me over for Thanksgiving dinner. So I would have Thanksgiving, because I wasn't going home. He heard that, and so he had me over for Thanksgiving dinner. But he also had me over for the presidential returns. And those presidential returns were not very pleasant. If you remember, um, uh, George McGovern didn't even carry his own state. 
And Jim got increasingly intoxicated during that evening <laughs> and, um, and was very, um, um, and finally he got a call, I think from NBC, but one of the big oh, networks yeah. finally called him. And he said, well, God damn it, he carried Massachusetts and that's all that matters, uh, was his response to that election. But he was always an, a very generous man, open with advice. And in that sense, I stayed in touch with him. And certainly, I would say my book on Washington, not just to mention that one in particular, reflects his view of leadership. Because what, Washington, what, what Burns always stressed was that a leader, and back then, of course, he was mostly Roosevelt. I mean, he, was, he didn't talk much about his uh, John Kennedy book. It was Roosevelt, Roosevelt, Roosevelt was his example. And Roosevelt, he believed so strongly that Roosevelt was a powerful leader in part because he was empowered by his assistants. The people he put, whether it's Hopkins or whoever, the people he put in office with him, in the cabinet, in the various appointive jobs, Roosevelt listened to them, was shaped by them, and he shaped them. And this relational leadership was so important. And so when I was looking at George Washington, that's what I saw. Now, I hope that wasn't wrong. I hope I wasn't biased um, to look at it in a Burnsian fashion and saw what wasn't there. But I think it was there. I think it is that Washington was the same sort of leader as Roosevelt. Washington always had surrounded himself with very strong leaders. I mean, think in his cabinet, you talk about George Carr Goodwin talking about Lincoln's team of rivals. Well, whatever Lincoln had, it didn't compare to have Jefferson and Hamilton in the same cabinet. And then you add um, uh, Knox and, and Randolph. Um, and Washington was a great listener, as Roosevelt was a great listener. And he would draw on these people, but in the same sense, you think about, and it wasn't just true when he was um, president, it was when he's true as a general, he would put together a, he would always listen to his junior aides. But think of the people he brought in with him. People like Hamilton, of course Jefferson, people like Alex, um, uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, um, Lafayette. They were forever changed by their experience with Washington. They were empowered by Washington to come back and be the next generation of leadership. Well, Roosevelt was the same way. He, was empo he empowered the next generation of leaders who then went off and became the senators and the congressmen and the governors. He empowered them by listening to them, working with them. And in a way, Jim as a professor was the same sort. He listened to his students. He wanted to hear what they had. He didn't just tell them. He just didn't lecture. He wanted them to go out and interview their congressmen and bring their ideas back. And he would listen to what they said. And you really felt that he was learning, that he was learning from what you were bringing back. Very few teachers I've ever had that experience. That you'd bring back and you'd be presenting your congressman. And he was like another one of the students, learning. So he was transformed. He was working on his book on leadership at that exact time. And some of the stories that come out of our classes go into his works. So he was the, that same sort. He would listen. He had a strong ideas, just like Roosevelt had strong ideas and just like Washington had strong ideas. And yet they were, he was changed by his students, and he changed his students. And that's the sort of um, man I think he brought that sort of viewpoint into his scholarship. And that I view as the core of his leadership studies. Great. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, Let me, uh, you know, let me just say that, that, that what Susan said about the election of 1962 and, and, and what Ed said about uh, the election of 1972 reminds me of, of, of two of my favorite uh, political bumper stickers. In 1962, when I was a freshman at Harvard, there were bumper stickers around, I back Jack, but Teddy isn't ready. Uh, <laughs> but, but he won big time anyway. And, and, and then, of course, Ed, as you suggested, there was the marvelous one, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, so the topic of our uh, two-day event is, uh, is, is remembering James McGregor Burns, and we're doing that at a, at a place where, of course, we remember George Washington. And I, and I, and I guess I, I would like to ask uh, all three of the panelists in no particular order, maybe, maybe Michael 
first uh, to talk about uh, you know, when you th think about what what are the lessons uh, for understanding presidential leadership that uh, come from uh, what you have learned from James McGregor Burns and, and, and George Washington. And, and, and let me lay one specific piece on that. And, and, and it, it came up in, 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 in both uh, what Ed and, and, and Susan said. Jim was very interested in conflict. And, and, and conflict was really a, a, a central concept in, in, in his work. And, and, and uh, I, I think what Ed was talking about in terms of uh, getting divergent points of view in, in the class and, and, and letting them compete was really a part of who he was as, as, as a scholar. And, Michael, do you want to well, yeah, very briefly. One thing I always found is sort of a paradox is that this is someone who intellectually loved conflict. You know, he was always saying, you know, the more conflict, the better. I want a political system where people are just duking it out all the time because that's the way you get the best policies. And I could never figure, I knew the man for 40 years. I could never quite understand how this person who was you know, the kind that he, he hated conflict personally. He hated to get into fights with people, yet intellectually he loved the notion of it. And that's something that he was united with George Washington intellectually, which is both of them knew that one of the reasons why we wanted our independence from England and our distance from the European monarchies was that there wasn't political conflict there. It was squashed. Right. All the policies came from the king or the queen. There was a record that was not kept or not shown to outsiders. And you didn't have the kind of conflict and the kind of open system that, you know, according to our founders, leads to the best kind of policies. So intellectually, they both loved conflict. Both George Washington and, and Jim, I think, were both personally, and I would even say intellectually, this having been said, a little bit squeamish about conflict, never quite came to grips with it. George Washington loved the idea of conflict, but when he began to be, and again, I'm not going to keep on saying that I'm less qualified to say this than the other two on my left, but when during his administration he, he was given increasing evidence that there were going to be factions and there were probably going to be political parties and they, they could be pretty rough in this country, Washington never quite came to grips with it. And in Jim's case, he was co for conflict. One of the things he argued for more than anything else over the years was that rather than have two umbrella parties that didn't differ very much ideologically and where there wasn't much ideological conflict, much better to have two parties that stood for very different things ideologically, you know, who would fight it out all day long in Congress and elsewhere. So part of it he was right about was that that does lead to the best policies. And when it's done in the right way, it leads people to want to participate in the political system because they think it'll accomplish something. I think the part of it he never quite came to grips with, and we had these discussions, he and I ourselves, was that what he never could predict, and this is an entirely rational point of view for him to have, I don't think he ever quite understood that when you had two differing ideological parties the way that we now have in the United States, especially in Congress, where the ideological overlap is probably less than it has been for most moments in American history, you wouldn't have the other thing that Jim Burns and George Washington both counted on as an essential element of the system, which is at the end of the day when all the conflict was done, you know, people would sit down and have a tankard of ale together and they would still be friends. They would still be able to talk with one another and there was still a relationship between them. Uh, like many other people, I think Jim Burns could never foresee that the way this would pan out in Congress would be not only two parties with not much ideological overlap who were fighting tooth and nail all day long, but people who were, you know, by the end of the day, did not know each other on the other side and were penalized if they did. Susan or Ed, you want to take a crack at this? Well, I, I think that Washington's greatness as a leader and especially as the nation, this young republic's first president, was his moderation. Um, and it's true that Jim believed in conflict and not in consensus, not in moderation. Jim in Georgia wrote a book called Dead Center, and it's about the Clinton-Gore 
co-presidency. And, and Clint, Clint and Gore enjoyed it very much. And uh, a book about them written called, called Dead, Dead Center. Dead Center. Right, right. Jim, <laughs> felt, Jim felt that, uh, that, that they were too centrist and that the center was dead. And he right. wanted more transformation, um, either uh, FDR or Ronald Reagan, but really principled, uh, trans more transforming leadership that makes a real difference. Um, but George Washington was moderate. George Washington, in fact, wanted the middle. When Jefferson and Hamilton were quarreling, Washington scolded them both and wrote very interesting letters to each of them saying, you must have more charity for the opinions of others. And until experience tells us what the right path is, and we have no infallible criteria now to, to know human reason is not so perfect, we must make allowances for the opinions of others and find a middle path. And George Washington always said that this was a great experiment that we were doing. It was untrodden ground. Um, but we and we would have to learn from experience, and that experience had to be learned and acquired slowly and through moderate means. He was a man of great self-restraint and great humility. Uh, one historian called George Washington a virtuoso of resignations. That uh, when he uh, and and also virtue, he showed the same humility when he resigned positions. Napoleon couldn't believe that George Washington would resign as commander in chief and not simply seize power. He said it was in inconceivable to him that someone could behave that way. So he, Washington was um, a virtuoso at resigning, but even when he was accepting positions of power, whether it was commander in chief or president, he was very, very humble and saying, um, I'm really not qualified for this, and I have um, many defects. I'm not that experienced, so you will have to make allowances for me. And if I fail, don't, don't blame me. You, you chose me. You drafted me into doing this. Um, that, that, uh, perhaps that was staged. Uh, but that was the public persona that he wanted, but it was a very helpful one because people trusted him with power because he, didn't know, he never seemed to be seeking power. And so he was really the right man for this um, revol revolutionary republic at the right time. Uh, and no, you can't say that about any other modern revolution except perhaps South Africa and Nelson Mandela, if you consider that a revolution. If you look at the French Revolution, Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, Cuban Revolution, it's all extremism. There's no moderation. It's my way or the highway, and if you disagree with me, I kill you, I guillotine you, I'll find some way to put you in jail. And you not, the, you not, the greatness of the American Revolution is that self-restraint and that tolerance for differences of opinion um, and differences of religion also, uh, and and that um, willingness, even when Washington and Hamilton were afraid of the Jeffersonians, didn't want to transfer power to from Adams and the Federalists to the new Jeffersonian Republicans, even when they didn't want to do that, nevertheless they did it. Can I can I throw in a question just for a second? That what you're raising, I don't want to interrupt. Uh, between George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, which one was Jim Burns instinctively drawn to? Jim's golden retriever, who passed away last March, his name was, that was Roosevelt. Before Roosevelt came Jefferson. A lawyer should never ask a question without knowing the answer, so <laughs> t tell us why. I think that uh, because Jim was so enamored of FDR. FDR played such a huge role in Jim's life. Um, and FDR loved Jefferson. I think FDR had been influenced by a book comparing Jefferson and Hamilton by a historian named Claude Bowers mm -hmm. that came out just about then in the early 30s. And Bowers' argument was that Hamilton was an aristocrat and Jefferson was a Democrat with a small d. Um, it's very odd to me because Jefferson, as you know, believed in small, frugal government. And he also wanted the United States to look like Virginia writ large. 
he didn't want industry. He didn't want industrialization. Jefferson didn't want banking. He didn't understand economics. He didn't want credit. He didn't understand all of these things. So to me, it really makes no sense that FDR was in love with Thomas Jefferson and put Thomas Jefferson on the first class stamp and started the project of the Thomas Jefferson papers and laid the ground stone for the Thomas Jefferson Memorial in Washington. What is the New Deal? What is FDR's presidency? It's all Hamiltonian. It's expansive government, expansive army, fiscal military state. It's, it's all about power and the state. But, but where was the balance of part power in the Democratic Party in the 1930s? It was in the South, and those committee chairmen of, who all loved Jefferson. There was not, nice there, was not a, there was not a big uh, Hamilton faction in Congress. Hey, let me get added here on, on conflict or, or, the, or the more general question of, of uh, presidential leadership. Well, on, on that, I think both Burns and Washington appreciated so much the importance of leadership. They didn't, they both thought followers were very important, but Burns didn't call it followership studies. He called it leadership studies. Mm -hmm. And he believed in the power of leaders to set a course, working, but realized, fully appreciated the importance that followers had in that relationship, that it was an interactive relationship. And Washington was much the same way. I mean, I think Washington deeply believed how important his action as a leader would be for the new country. I think in many ways a country, we look at the effects of the leaders when there's a transitional change and how that legacy lives on. So you get countries like Russia living on in the legacy of Stalin and you get the United States living on in the legacy of a Washington. And that in some ways, when we are at our darkest hours, I think it politically, we're living on the legacy of Washington because Washington established a certain sense of virtue, of a virtuous leadership leader who wanted to serve the public good and didn't want to necessarily aggrandize himself. And someone of huge self-restraint. Huge self-restraint. And most people go into politics are not people right. of huge self-restraint. And he had a, just like, for example, in Eisenhower, another exceptional leader, I think, as president, he had a ter he had a, quite a temper, mm -hmm. but he never showed it in public. Mm -hmm. He kept himself under control. And Washington was always comfortable in his own skin. He knew who he was, and he didn't need praise from other people. I think Burns was like that too. He was very comfortable in his own skin and he, would, he, would, he wasn't always trying to prove himself, which is true of many historians and many writers and other things. They're, they care so much. Washington was comfortable who he was. Jim Burns was comfortable who he was. So in that sense, they appreciated the importance of leadership with fully recognizing the importance of your followers and of leading people and creating the next generation of leadership. And that's where I found Washington very much like FDR, perfect examples for Burns's idea. I never thought personally that Burns spent enough time on Washington because he'd find Washington a perfect example of what he wanted. In some ways, not in others, but in some ways better than Jefferson for his ideas. Well, although for leadership. someone who wants strong political parties, it doesn't quite do it. He wanted strong political parties, but he also, if you watched, um, Washington. Washington had very strong ideas. And when you talk about listening to others, he was willing to compromise. But his compromises were always on means, not ends. Right. And I think Roosevelt was the same way, willing to compromise on means, not ends. And I think Burns's theory of leadership, what he valued in a leader was a leader who was willing to compromise on means without losing sight of his goals, his true. He would recognize what's really important and aim for that, and not be worried about getting all the credit all the time. Somebody who's willing to step back if he needs to, and or she needs to, and in some, in many ways, Washington exemplified all that. So in a in a way, I think that the the value placed on a leader and the tone a leader sets, the people who followed after in leadership positions after Washington 
were basically all very close to or even students of, of Washington. I mean, Jefferson in his cabinet, Adams, well, they had a tense relationship, but Adams, of course, had been vice president, and he certainly watched Washington in power. Madison, who comes next, was very close to Washington. I mean, he, when the, in, the, in the months leading up, most of the months leading up to the writing of the Constitutional Convention, Madison was living here, not at his home. He was living here at Mount Vernon during those months before they went up, and Washington was at every meeting when they wrote the Virginia Plan. Um, so they had a very close relationship. Madison was his first prime minister, as they called him, when he was, when he was president. And of course, Monroe, Monroe was with him on the boat going across the, when he crossed the Delaware. So he had close ties with so many of these people. Uh, and that's the sort of impacting relationship. That's the sort of leadership that Burns thought was just what a country like the United States needs. Let me ask you a question about uh, Washington and conflict. And, and uh, let's start with that, but all three of you. And, 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 and then my question is, is, is upon the question that Michael said, whether uh, Washington became less enchanted with the idea of conflict o over time and, 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 and would be very disenchanted with it today. I'm, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of working in the Constitutional Convention, and there's a tremendous amount of conflict. But something good comes out of it. A compromise can happen, and, and, and really good things. But then in, the, in his farewell address, if, if, if I'm remembering correctly, he warned against political parties, oh, which, yeah. which, which seemed to be uh, anti-conflict positions. Uh, and and, and I, I just can't believe he would be excited about conflict as he would It'd be horrifying. if you were to see it today. Absolutely. Washington wanted people to have strong ideas. He wanted Hamilton and Madison and Jefferson he appreciated having strong ideas. He, he thought, though, that when people were elected to office, they were called by the people to serve with their best judgment. And he didn't, he never shied away when people in Congress had very different ideas. You think of Richard Henry Lee, who opposed ratification of the Constitution and fought tooth and nail, and yet they remained good friends. And on his way to become a senator, the first senator from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee stopped by Mount Vernon. They had a very cordial relationship. And then when he gets up there, uh, Richard Henry Lee is as good a supporter as Washington has, even though there'd been a tremendous conflict before. And the letters, the things that Washington wrote about Richard Henry Lee during the, during the ratification process, you hardly want to repeat. Um, and yet, they worked together. But what he appreciated of Richard Henry Lee is that he differs on one issue, but he brings an open mind to the next. And what Washington didn't like, that there was a partisan view that, that everything was a lockstep. He thought each senator and congressman, even though they were strongly different on one bill, would bring their best judgment to the next issue and their best judgment to the next work and not act as a party. So he always appreciated, remember, Washington was first a politician. He was elected to the House of Burgesses by hard campaigning the same year as Richard Henry Lee. They went the same year. Richard Henry Lee was the first family of Virginia. He got the seat automatically. Washington had a fight for it. Remember, he was, the, he was from the second wife. He wasn't ever supposed to inherit Mount Vernon. He thought he had to work for a living. That's why he became a surveyor. And I think that aspect that he thought he'd have to work for a living and not inherit a plantation, it was just that his two older stepbrothers died. And he happened to get the plantation and then married very well um, with a lot of money, richest widow. And that was able to build his plantation. But before that, he was trying to build his work as a. And then he gets elected to the House of Burgess and continues to get reelected. And then when the First Continental Congress meets, Everyone in the House of Burgesses wants the job. Well, what sort of retail politician? Here he wasn't part of the first family. He wasn't established. He gets elected by the House, elite House of Burgesses to be in the First Continental Congress. That took real politics. And it was that sort of, and he knew there were differences, so he'd always played that game. He just didn't expect it to be lockstep, that on every issue they're the same rather that there would be shifting coalitions on each issue. So he was the, I think Washington was very open to conflict. He just didn't think it should be institutionalized. It should be on each individual battle. Let me, uh, time has just flown. <laughs>
and, and, I, and I'd like to get Susan and, and Michael to comment on this if, if they want to, but, but then I want to uh, open it up to see what questions people in the audience want to ask. Susan. Well, in the farewell address, you might remember that Washington warns against parties, and he says that he doesn't um, believe in parties, that they're engines of um, infamy that will uh, cause so much disruption in the country and so much insecurity, especially if parties alternate in power, that eventually people will want security and stability and turn to a despot. And he, he says that very clearly, that parties will lead to despotism. And their parties really didn't exist yet, and there was no theory about parties. And when the Constitution was designed, there weren't political parties. So the whole government, the whole idea of checks and balances isn't about uh, political parties. And Washington believed that, uh, yes, people might disagree, but that there was a common good, a public good, and that parties pl placed themselves and their own particular interests above the common good. I asked my students this question, is, was Washington right about that? Is there such a thing as the public good? Is there anything that we agree on? One student raised his hand and said, legalization of marijuana. <laughs> it's true. I said, I, I don't think we all agree on that. <laughs> I, I don't think we all agree on anything, but Washington was in a way idealistic enough or naive enough to think that there was a common good. And I think uh, today we realize that disagreement is healthy, that an open, vital democracy, a real open, vital democracy, depends on disagreements. We should disagree. I, th I think the other thing is, just to build on what you're saying, is that Washington extrapolated from his own life experience, and he assumed that because he was in a generation where he and every American who had lived through the Revolutionary War knew what a close run thing it really w was and how many sacrifices, mm -hmm. how many lives had been risked to give us our independence. And he assumed that anyone in that generation would therefore feel so bound to making this country work that there would be a limit to the conflict, there'd be a dampener. And that was true for at least the generation that remembered that. You get up to probably the 1850s, that's no longer the case. You look at what happened in Congress. And so when Lincoln was talking in his inaugural about the mystic cords of memory that stretch back to every patriot grave, what he was saying was, here we are dealing with the most divisive issue in our history thus far, which is slavery. Why don't we remember the time of the revolutionary period and when we did feel that that kinship uh, didn't work then, we have even less of it now. And so I think without that dampener, to conflict, I think we're just fated to have the kind of system we now have, which and I think Washington would be horrified by. And the first part of that paragraph of Lincoln is in person. We, we must we be friends, not enemies, yeah, and let's, right. let's not let the conflict drive us apart. Right, right. Uh, yeah. uh, I hope it didn't pan out, but uh, he, he, he embodied that hope. Let, you know, let us take some questions from, from, from all of you. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, think, I think we've got the to be ones out that of, stand out. We've got to be out of here, buddy. Yeah. Ed, why don't you? Well, no, you can. No, no, no. The I, normal. I, no, I I'll, just I'll say Susan. something then. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go after. I you. know what Jim would say. He'd yeah. say that it's a failure of our constitutional system. It's not a failure of the leaders. Jim, <laughs> one of the first conversations I had with Jim that certainly was surprising yeah. to me. I said something uh, very positive about checks and balances. We're all raised and socialized and educated to believe in checks and balances. And Jim said he didn't believe in checks and balances. Uh, that, that's a, a formula, he called it a horse and buggy formula for stasis, for paralysis mm -hmm. in government. What Jim wanted, at bottom line, is British parliamentary democracy, a majority party in power, an opposition that can mm -hmm. challenge them, but ca cannot thwart them and block them in any way. Does he want two polarized parties? Today we complain, oh, there's no bipartisanship. There's too much polarization. That's fine with Jim, and that's fine in Great Britain. You want polarization. You want unified, responsible, um, ideological parties. And, uh, and, and that, listen to uh, Prime Minister's Question Hour, and you'll see the kind of 
um, democracy that Jim believed in, which is majoritarian. Now, very quickly, what Jim would like to have seen, he knows that there's not going to be a change in constitution and we're not going to have British parliamentary democracy, but he felt that there could be some changes. For instance, he felt that the Senate is grossly unproportional, mm -hmm. the Electoral College is not democratic, the staggered elections, you elect a third of senators with one year, another third, another third. So what Jim's solution would be to try to make this system more parliamentarian is to have every one senators, congressmen, president elected at the same time for the same term, for a, let's say a four-year term. The country is in a certain mood, yeah. a pro-war mood, an anti-war mood, whatever. And so most likely they're going to elect a team. And that team will represent a majority. But the way the government is structured now and the way elections take place is that it's virtually impossible to have a, ma a majoritarian government. And in fact, with some of the Senate rules, like filibuster, you wind up with a minority government. The minority has control in the Senate. And, and one, one thing I can add to that is that when I was first a student, which was the fall of 1974, as Susan was mentioning, I can remember that one of the arguments he made for not only having ideological parties, but just having strong parties in general, and especially in the presidential nominating process was, that you have to have a strong party in the presidential nominating process because unless people have to go to a strong party to get a nomination and then run for president in the fall, the alternative is gonna be that people are gonna do this on the basis of money and they're gonna have to raise gargantuan amounts of money and anyone who w wants to run for president, he said this 41 years ago, is gonna have to go hat in hand to people who have a lot of money but also want something for it. And he and lamented uh, both Kennedy and George W. Bush's campaigns running alone uh, in, 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 in book, uh, being outside the party structure and, right. and right. using exactly. money and personal yeah. resources. Right. The two campaigns that were very well funded. Yeah. 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 And uh, I have, of course, heard the same thing as you all did uh, from Burns that it's the system not the, not the participants in the system. And, and, um, and the way the system recruits certain kind of people to come into it. And if you had a parliament, he, was a bit, he, he truly wanted a parliamentary democracy. And he thought with that, you could have strong parties. And strong parties, such as you have in England, they would take power. They would push their agenda. You could have a Margaret Thatcher, or you could have an Edward Heath. And they'd push through their ideas. And you'd see how they worked out rather than having everything um, stymied by two different groups. Uh, he also thought of strong parties would lead to more efficient and effective government and more accountable government, and okay. also agreed that if you, if, you, if you could bypass the party system, and I remember talking to him, he was, he was very, frustrated with Jimmy Carter's nomination because he thought, at least when I was talking to him, that Jimmy Carter had sort of bypassed the Democratic Party system and he manages to figure out McGovern's reforms and go outside the system and build, get up enough electoral votes, uh, enough um, delegates to win and then win the presidency. But when he gets the presidency, there's no party. I mean, he's not part of the Democratic system. He can't even work with his own party. So he can't even get the congressmen and senators, and he didn't have the personal skills to cross over because um, he was Jimmy Carter. And he had Jody Powell, and he had Burt Lance, and he had his little group. And it was separate from the party, and he liked it more when a person was more connected with the party. In fact, that's probably the one saving grace he had with Nixon. He thought at least Nixon was tied in with the Republican Party, you know, he sort of ran his own, but he'd use him as an example of a, of a different sort. So that sort of, that frustrated him. In fact, he was very happy to tie Nixon into the Republican Party. Yes, he was yeah. very happy, but he viewed, he viewed him as a, as a part of the party. And the person going outside the party and not getting elected through the party only made the situation even worse. So that's what his answer would be. Um, I think that the current situation is even more extreme than the situation that he experienced back in the 70s and 80s, but it is a part of the type of system that he thought would be the inevitable, an inevitable problem of 
giving senators so much power. Each senator is like a god to themselves because with the, the, what the filibuster really does is empower individual senators. So you can even be part of the minority um, as long as you're not below 60, as long as you've got somewhere between, uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 in your uh, uh, 40 and 50 in your party, you can still shake down all the donors for the money because they need your vote to break a filibuster and every single vote is, is subject to a filibuster. So the direction the filibuster has gone would, uh, would frustrate them even more because it gives, it ends up empowering individuals rather than an accountable group. Could I follow up on the question about standouts of, of, of uh, leadership? Uh, you, you, you know, you've all talked about the, about the system being a problem. Um, well, I, I think are, you, are there any individual examples? You, you, well, you, it's, I give one. <laughs> the current <laughs> times, Carter. we're historians. We don't deal with <laughs> letting people <laughs> come back and. Yeah, yeah, yes. It had elements of what we're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about comity, for instance, as late as the 1960s, you had, I mean, for instance, people often say nowadays, you know, this is the most polarized political system in American history. Well, if you look at the behavior in Congress, it probably looks that way, given people are afraid to talk to each other across the aisle on penalty of death from their party leaders, it seems. But, uh, is this a period in which the differences that politically divide Americans are greater than any time in American history? I mean, slavery, you know, economics in the 30s, what you do about Hitler. I mean, the differences nowadays are pretty moderate compared to those, but, but it's now been institutionalized. Uh, I think probably, I mean, I'd be interested in what the others say, but I think for the rest of my lifetime, it is probably likely that it's going to be this way or worse because this kind of thing is instituted. It, it's, it's basically now part of the structure of Congress. Is it a change? Or was there something I think, oh. I think it's gone back and forth, okay. if I can. Uh, we've had so, periods when you've a little had, bit more hopeful than I am. When you've, no, when you've had strong um, party dominance. So what Washington had during at least his, uh, the beginning of his administration, what Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe had, um, what Lincoln had after the Southerners walked out, he could push through everything the Republicans and Whigs had ever dreamed about, from, from the land-grant colleges to, to the National Academy of Sciences to the first national parks, everything, uh, railroads, everything that the Whigs and the Republicans, because he controlled, um, he, his party was in control. When you think of the Harding-Coolidge era, um, they could get through whatever they wanted to. Um, Roosevelt had it. Johnson had it for a while. Um, and so when you had that sort of dominance in Congress, you had to negotiate with your, with your chairman. But you were all, and so you had those periods. Then you've had periods throughout history where we've had a very tight break. Sometimes a president of one party, sometimes um, the party of the other. And, you know, they're complaining about all the problems being that foreign policy ends on the border and the attacks on Obama for the nuclear uh, atomic deal with Iran are unprecedented. Well, think what Wilson faced with the League of Nations and the peace settlement. It was because he had a Republican Senate. He had Lodge and all the others that he was fighting. The divisions were just as sharp then, and the deadlock was, was the same sort of deadlock you faced. I think Truman faced that. Um, with the Republicans in, co in Congress when Truman, part of Truman's presidency. So I think this thing comes and goes, and the issue is right now we've got a strong, very unusually unified Republican Party in Congress, and we've got a Democratic president. And um, so you get this sort of, um, sort of gridlock. And, and, and Michael, you've written about the Jay Treaty. And, and, yeah, and, and, and that was an end of conflict yeah. there. But, but what I'm saying there yeah. is that those were principal differences between the two parties when they fought it out. Right. And for most of American history in Congress, negotiation and compromise was not a dirty word. As we know from the founding period, 
you know, one of the other presumptions that George Washington had about our political system as it would unfold was that not only would there be the kind of comity there was in the, in the revolutionary period, but that people in Congress would, would realize that compromise was something that made this system work. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you want to become a leader of either of the two parties in Congress, I would not advise you to sell yourself to your peers by saying, I'm great at negotiation, compromise, and I can make deals across the aisle. The way to do it is, I, I will be a firebrand, and I can raise lots of money, and I can go on t TV and vilify the other side. All I'm saying is that even in a period, you know, especially in a period where there is divided uh, party control of government, you're not going to have those elements that a George Washington would have, would have relied on. You mentioned Harry Truman. 1947 to 1949 was a Republican Congress, Democratic president. They differed on economics. You know, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed against Truman's wishes, but there was no, enough of a respect for compromise with the president that the entirety of the whole post-World post War II foreign policy was passed mm -hmm. during those two years as a result of compromises between Truman and Arthur, Arthur Vandenberg and other prominent Republicans. All I'm saying is that given the subculture nowadays, it'd be very hard for a Vandenberg to have that kind of party leadership position. But that's where I was contrasting. Um, they lived in the terrible legacy of the battles between Lodge and Wilson True. at the end of World War I, True. and now there was this internet, um, joint commitment to, to internationalism and to being involved. But we had that, the same sort of division that was a deadlock right after World War I. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were determined. And remember, the country was facing the same sort of threats of terrorism we're having now. They were blowing up the Attorney General's office. And there were timed explosions in Boston. Sure. And there were police strikes. And there, the sense, of, the sense of, of this whole thing's falling apart would be similar to the sense we have today. So these things sure. have happened before. I'm saying they're not unique. I don't know how we'll get over this one, but I don't think I, I just how. hope that Ed is right rather than me. <laughs> well, a return to normalcy yeah. would be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Made Jefferson curious. Yeah, well, he was, as my two colleagues have said, more of a po politician than people re realized. But, but the nut of it was that Washington was, in the end, this was someone, in, I've written about this, he loved to be loved, as we all know. Uh, you know, there are, are some politicians who do pride themselves, you know, Roosevelt said, for instance, in 1936 in Madison Square Garden, you know, my, the forces of greed and selfishness are unanimous in their hatred for me, and I welcome their hatred. Well, Washington never welcomed anyone's hatred. He loved to be loved. And that is why it took an enormous degree of character and self-restraint for him to take the kind of risk that he did take by sending John Jay to London to bring back this highly unpopular treaty that made George Washington so unpopular that when he died two years here at Mount Vernon, two years after he left the presidency, prematurely for someone who had otherwise been so healthy, Martha Washington said it was because he was so despondent over the fact that many Americans who were angry over him, at him over Jay's treaty, it was said that Jay had it worse because unlike Washington, Jay was burned in effigy and Jay, unlike Washington, had a sense of humor about it. Jay said, I can walk the length of the United States at night merely by the light of all my burning effigies, which is probably <laughs> true. So at least Washington was fair about it. Ed, you want to comment on this? this well, the big question. I mean, the reason why Washington did it was that he thought that he believed, he believed that America could not get in an international. He believed that they, if, he, if America was called into this battle between the French and the Americans, it would never survive as an independent country. He deeply believed that. He also, what? 
We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. Yeah. We couldn't do it. It would not survive. And his goal, one of his key goals, was maintaining American sovereignty, maintaining American independence of action. He believed we should trade with both. We should have an international trading partner because he knew our main trading partners were the island, nation, island colonies in the Caribbean of the French and the British. That's where our foodstuffs were going. That was our main overseas market, and they had all this money because of the sugar, the wealth down there. So he desperately wanted to keep the markets to both the French and the British islands open in the Caribbean. And so he wanted to get through this period. He believed that a treaty with England of some sort was absolutely necessary. He had a Western vision. He thought the future of America lie in the West. So to him, getting the British out of the frontier forts, which was one of the results of the Jays Treaty, was in very important, central important to his whole goal as president of the United States. Um, so with all those in mind, I, he believed that if he told Jefferson, Jefferson could rally up opposition that would make the treaty never succeed. And so he felt that he couldn't tell Jefferson because that would undermine the treaty that wouldn't work with Jefferson. What was he wrong in thinking that? Not, not the way Jefferson operated. Jefferson sent, Jefferson working with Madison yeah. could do amazing jobs of sending out to his partisan newspapers. I mean, Jefferson was a, was a, was a powerful politician. He was a lion in the fox. That's why I'm not surprised that, Rosa, uh, that Burns was an incredible admirer of Jefferson. And Washington understood Jefferson. And Jefferson was mad, but I think partly because he was beat at his own game. I think we have time for one more round. Is it, is, is and, and we'll all be around afterwards. Is, 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 and, and then there will, will be a reception. But, but is there a? Yes, sir. I think he learned strength of character from his mother. Um, I agree, they had an awful relationship. I mean, she was always asking for money and complaining and saying, there's my son, he's going off to war fighting with people he has no fight against. Why doesn't he stay home and take care of me? Um, they would, she, she complained so much that, um, that everybody thought she was a Tory. And um, uh, for, for going off and fighting these British, why don't you just take care of me? And um, she was always disappointed in her son. I seem to be, and if, you, if, if George Washington couldn't make his, her, his mother proud of him, all of us who can't please our mothers should feel very, very <laughs> much at comfort. But I think he learned from her. Uh, well, all of us who can't please our mothers is everyone. Is everyone, yeah. <laughs> so if Washington couldn't, who could? Um, and I, but she gave him a strength of character that I think in some ways he learned from his mother, and he was tough like his mother, and his mother was very tough. Um, and um, I, he learned it partly through that. He learned it partly, I believe, because he knew, he thought he'd have to make it on his own. So he read the virtues that would work well. He, Washington was an amazing man um, in, in many respects. But in one is he had very close ties. He was very loyal. He had very close individual ties with other people. Um, well, that sounds like, well, everybody does. Well, no, not everybody does. Um, uh, he had his relationship with Lord Fairfax. I mean, he was like another father to him. And um, so he could get people who were older to really like him, trust him, and he could learn from them and learn the virtues that would cover, cultivate those relationships. Now, that's one thing Alexander Hamilton could do. Alexander Hamilton could have, have relationships where he would get a lot from rich people above him. Um, but Washington could also have very close friendships with his peers, like George Clinton, who was like a brother to him, I believe, and the great governor of New York. Um, even though they had difference of opinions, they were very close. And Washington could also have very close relationships with people under him, the Hamiltons, the Lawrence, 
who I think would have been a great leader if he hadn't died, really one of the great leaders, Lafayette, Madison for a time. He had great relationships down. And I think he learned from those other relationships. He learned the virtues that he had from those relationships with other people. He also had great relationships with women. I mean, he would go off to with plays or events or teas with women other than Martha. And, um, and he had very close ties with these, I mean, almost like a brother-sister relationship. With them. And those sort of ties, I think, taught him a lot in dealing with other people at an individual level. And when you think about it, how many of us have so many close individual ties with people, and we learn from those ties with people. And that's the side of Washington that when we see him on Mount Rushmore, we lose sight of, because the Washington we see is sort of an icon, a wax figure. And it's these interpersonal relationships. And I think that was one of his great teachers. We also think the other great American of the period, I think Washington was one of the two indispensable men for the revolution. We would not have succeeded without him. Franklin was the other. And Franklin also never had an education. Franklin also had relationships and, and ties, whereas the Jeffersons and the Adams, you know, they went to the best colleges in their states or their colonies. Um, so I think he got it from dealing with people and from inter, in, um, interpersonal relationships. Like, and like Franklin, he liked to read. He read a lot. He read plays. And you can learn a lot from reading plays and reading novels. Don Quixote was a, a book he loved. You can learn a lot from those things. So I think he, he, he learned from those various different respects. We were fortunate to have two men like Franklin and Washington at the time of our revolution, because heaven only knows how it would turn out if it were, they were all like mm -hmm. Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I mean, Susan, or all like um, Hancock, I was going to say. <laughs> Susan, what would you, you like the last word? I'd like to broaden that. It's such an interesting question, but I'd like to broaden it out a bit. Um, I say to my students, you know, in these 13 colonies, there were 3 million people. And, the small population, uh, I guess the smaller than Brooklyn, New York now, um, produced these Madison, a Madison, a Hamilton, a Washington, a Jefferson. And today we have 350 million. And I say, where's the beef? <laughs> we have Bushes and Gores. I mean, Bushes and Clinton. So I assigned to my students three articles. And I think these three articles give you very, very interesting and different perspectives on how this amazing generation of revolutionary leaders came about. One article is by a historian named Douglas Adair, who wrote a book mm -hmm. called Fame mm -hmm. and the Founding Fathers. Mm -hmm. And his argument is that these young men mm -hmm. were very ambitious, mm -hmm. and what they wanted was fame. And you see that. Mm -hmm. You see the young George Washington copying mm -hmm. rules of civility, mm -hmm. wanting to be respected by his superiors. There was that that need. You mm -hmm. see it in Hamilton, who was 14 year, years old and on the island of St. Croix, mm -hmm. and writing to his friend. And he says, Ned, my ambition is prevalent. Mm -hmm. They were all ambitious. And you see it in Washington, his temper tantrums when he, and during the French and Indian Wars. He writes to Colonel Dinwiddie and to someone named Fitzhugh, saying uh, that he's not being offered the commission that he wanted. He wants the red uniform in the British Army, not just to be part of the Virginia militia. Mm -hmm. And he's very, very incensed. And how dare you think that I would accept such a commission? You see that ambition. And then later on, during the American Revolution, he says um, he, he's much more humble. He never puts on uh, temper tantrums like that. And he writes to someone, and he says, during this war, the fate of mankind is at stake. This, uh, this revolution is so important. And Something more important than his own ego is at stake. And he realizes that in the French and Indian Wars, nothing of importance was at stake, nothing at all. And so he could um, be ambitious and, and talk about his ego. So Adair's conclusion is that th this generation, he, I wish I had written this sentence because it's about alchemy. And I have to ask my students if they know what alchemy is. Douglas Adair wrote a sentence that they transmute a leaden desire for self-aggrandizement into a golden concern for public service. It's this leaden desire for self-aggrandizement that they have, but they marry it to public service. And, they, and, they, and then it's win-win, because the public gets the, these fantastic leaders, and they get immortality. And we're mm -hmm. speaking about George Washington here today. 
He got what he wanted. He is immortal. And, there, and these revolutionary leaders are immortal. Very quickly, Bernard Balin's article is uh, to create the world anew. His art, art, where, argument, where did Balin happen to go to college? He went to Williams. He didn't like, he, in fact, he didn't like Williams. We invited him back. He said no. Um, he taught at Harvard. And, but his article is, he makes a geographical argument. He says that these colonies were outside of the mainstream of Europe. They were in the middle of nowhere. Because they were in the middle of nowhere, that permitted great creativity, great imagination. And Gordon Wood's article is called The Democratization of Mind. And his argument is that these people were, for the most part, the, the social elite of the colonies. They were very well educated. Because they were the social elite and the educated elite, they felt that it was their responsibility to be the leaders and the political leaders of, of their uh, communities. And those three... Um, Perspectives, I, I think, explain the, the genius of this generation. Michael, I'll, I'll be like one minute. Just to get back to your really good point about mm -hmm. you know leadership studies and so on. Uh, one reason why Americans love stories like this, like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Harry Truman, is that in the end, as both of you have said, these people really taught themselves how to be leaders. Mm -hmm. And Jim Burns's mm -hmm. point was. That's great, and we should admire them, but it's too dangerous as a society for us to be just dependent on a George Washington happen happening to come along with the ambition to acquire leadership skills. So mm -hmm. the whole point of writing his great book, Leadership, which came out in 78, and mm -hmm. this still expanding field of leadership studies, which Al and Susan particularly are involved in, was mm -hmm. to make sure that for Americans in the world of the future that there'll be a body of information and skills and teaching that can show someone who would like to be a leader, you know, where effective leaders of the past succeeded in the past. Could I thank all three of you for teaching us so much tonight. This has just been great. And now, Doug, there's a... Uh, right outside. Right outside. <laughs>